your thoughts are entitled Pastor Russell's World Tour. You know that the pastor traveled a lot, and he was frequently in Europe. He went over to London and, and around Europe quite a bit. But there was one point in 1912 where he actually did a worldwide tour. Now, these are pictures they were uh, gleaned off of newspapers, so they are grainy at times, but that adds to the character of it. You'll notice a yellow arrow. I hope that doesn't detract. That's pointing to the pastor. The theme of this tour, and this is from the convention reports, was this gospel, the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And so this is really a tour map of his round-the-world tour. And he was described as the people's favorite preacher. And as we'll find out, he was uh, published in almost 4,000 newspapers around the world. And this tour really had a profound effect on that, uh, that witness. The objectives of the uh, tour were given in the convention report. First, to ascertain prevalent social and religious conditions. So not only of Christendom around the world, but also other religions. Secondly, to evaluate the methods and results of conducting foreign missions by churches. So he's looking at how to be more effective worldwide. You know, I've had the privilege of going to Africa a few times, and they call this feet on the ground in Africa. And it's very important because every culture is different. People think differently in different parts of the world. And as you'll see from this tour, the pastor really had an eye-opening experience, especially in Asia. And I think it changed some of his mission. In fact, one of the things we notice in retrospect is that the work on translation increased markedly after this tour because he saw the importance of putting the word in uh, the native language of so many peoples. It says to draw international attention to the truth movements and its unique message of the harvest time. And really that continues even down to our day, doesn't it? And then another place it says, the object of this tour was to arouse in the public mind greater interest in his movement and message. There was actually a uh, Pastor Russell and six other elders that went on this uh, trip, and you may recognize some of the names. And along the way, of course, there were others that joined and then left at different points. And so you will see these uh, characters. And here is uh, Pastor Russell with General Hall and Professor Lindquist prior to the trip, and they're doing some planning. Remember in the convention report, they have a list of all the service areas and then the talk titles. And these are the ones that were published in the list. But as you read through the details of the convention report, you'll see that I'll actually put the title of talks, and you'll see how they uh, kind of suited the talks to the area and addressed uh, the needs of the people in the particular place they were in. And there are actually many more than this. So we started off, obviously, in New York. With the, uh, proceeded to Chicago, St. Louis, Dallas, San Antonio, Los Angeles, to Oakland, California, and then around the world. So we'll take this briefly. So starting in Chicago, this is a uh, picture of the train station about that time. And they took the uh, Wabash from Chicago to St. Louis. And when he was in St. Louis, he, he stopped and talked to a class there on calls on those in bondage. So he really was talking about those uh, that are under the bondage of the, uh, the creeds and doctrines of men. And that was his talk to the class there. This was a picture, and, and these inscriptions come from the convention report or titles that were actually on the pictures. So it says, Pastor Russell's and friends talking it over. I will tell you that the, the pastor was a good dresser. As a representative of the Lord, he wanted to look appropriate. And so you'll see on this trip that he's a sharp dresser throughout the trip, despite the conditions. And some of them were pretty uh, trying. Here's the pastor. Uh, he's 62, 63 years old on this world tour. And you're going to see some of the conditions, and they are pretty darn awful. And yet, I want you to notice their focus remains throughout the trip. So they continued on to Dallas, Texas, and this is a picture of him in Dallas, Texas. You notice he switched hats. Now he has his top hat, and he really looks dapper in his top hat. And he's going, and there were two talks given to the Dallas class. I didn't really find out what the subjects were, but... 
you know, this was very much a working tour. It wasn't a uh, leisure vacation at all. Then they headed for San Antonio on December 8th. And from there, they took an express train that took them all the way to Los Angeles over a two and a half day period. He started out with a uh, class talk on the wrath of God revealed against all unrighteousness. And that, that was the talk for the class. Well, that was in the morning. At three o'clock in the afternoon, they had a public witness, which he spoke on, which is the true gospel. So you see, very, very active. So we especially appreciate that zeal. He continued on by train up to Oakland, California, and there was a joint meeting of the Oakland and San Francisco classes, and his talk was on the future work of the church after the millennium. So some wonder, did the pastor talk about, you know, what's going to happen in the ages to come? Well, that's what he talked about. And once again, some of them are actually transcribed in the convention reports. The next day they got on the ship to go across the Pacific. And the ship was the Shino Maru. Uh, by our standards, not a small ship, but not a large ship either. Only 550 feet long, 63 feet wide, about 40 feet high. And this was the third trans-Pacific voyage from Japan for this particular ship. So it was a brand new ship, very luxurious in its day. And as they lifted anchor, there was an immense crowd of people waving their handkerchiefs to the friends on board. But a lot of these were the members of the Oakland and San Francisco class. So it was a very impressive sight, and so they took pictures of that. It said, soon we passed through the Golden Gate and we're on our way to the Great Pacific, an average depth of two miles and 6,000 miles across. That's, that's pretty imposing. Uh, if you've flown across the Pacific, it's a long plane flight. I can't imagine being on a, a ship and going that far. But this was the mode of transportation, and this was pretty luxurious in its day. And he noticed that the crew were mostly Japanese and some Chinese, of course. That's where the ship was from, was Japan, and they had a full complement of crew. Pastor Russell kept two stenographers busy the entire voyage over, so the work didn't end. And what we find out is they would send the information back so the work was going on of keeping the watchtower going during this trip. And the way he did that is he worked a lot. And the rest of the committee met each morning for a dawn study. They said a few passengers would also come in. So it wasn't just, you know, brethren on the ship. And there was a few that would come in. But like today, there were few and far between the hearing ears as they had studies. And they also worked on their, one of their goals was to completely re read the volumes on this trip. And at this part of the trip, they probably had a pretty good chance. It got more grueling. They pulled into uh, Honolulu, and this is a picture from December 19, 1911. And it was called the Par Paradise of the Pacific. Uh, there was supposed to be a party of missionaries. Well, they didn't make the ship. And the pastor, looking for an invitation, said, well, we'll come in over to the... Uh, school, and uh, so he did. He gave a talk on what is the gospel message. So this may not have been the message that the original missionaries wanted to uh, have given in that school, but doubtless uh, it was the one that God intended to have given at that school. From there, they continued across the Pacific. So when you get to Hawaii, you're about a third of the way. So they've got a long ways to go. So they're going from uh, Hawaii to Yokohama, which is a harbor for a deep water port for Japan. Sunday, by request of the captain, uh, he asked Pastor Russell to do the divine worship service. And so what did Pastor Russell give? He gave a talk for three quarters of an hour of the entire plan of God. How appropriate. You know, uh, the thing that I'm impressed with is he didn't, nobody on this trip got rest. I'm, I'm telling you the talks that the pastor gave the other elders also gave talks. We'll mention a few. I want to let you know this was very much a, uh, a work trip. And isn't that exactly what we would expect? They continued for many days, sunset on the Pacific. And on December 25th, uh, it was Christmas. They just crossed the international date line the day before. So they went from the 23rd to the 25th. And Brother Russell has been invited by the captain once again to give an address 
appropriate to the occasion, Christmas. So he did. They decorated the ship with 400 flags, and I noted that they even had a real Christmas tree. So, you know, here's the pastor giving a talk on Christmas next to a Christmas tree. Uh, the pastor used whatever was there and doubtless used this as an opportunity for witness. And so we think this is very marvelous. And this was, uh, once again, deluxe accommodations. You see it's very ornate. They're still somewhat in the tropical Pacific as they head towards Japan, and they're out on the deck enjoying the sunshine. And here's the pastor, and uh, you can see he's got a smile on his face as he looks out at this uh, beautiful ocean. They arrived in Japan about uh, five days later, on January 30th. The thing that struck me about Japan was that it was a very foreign world to him. He had not been exposed, and you can tell by the pictures that they take. And, of course, they were most impressed by the rickshaw, and you can see the pastor. Typically, you can pick him out because he's tall, has a beard, and wears really dapper top hat. And that's him right there in a rickshaw. And so they were quite intrigued by this, that they were going to be pulled by a, a man who gets between shafts and trots along, sometimes miles without stopping. Soon we were seated in one of these queer conveyances and trotted off by our human horses. So you see they were quite, uh, quite taken by this mode of transportation. Here they are at the Imperial Hotel in uh, Tokyo, and once again all the rickshaws, it's like the taxis of today, right? They're all lined up, ready to go. They continued. The next day was a busy day. They had made an arrangement for two meetings at the YMCA. There were fully 1,300 present, mostly young Japanese men. And at the afternoon service, there was another 700 for the evening meeting. So were there seeds of truth in Japan? Yes. And there was an interest in him. As we said, he had been uh, published worldwide. And the pastor wrote on the signs of the times, so he spoke on that, and also the great hereafter. So there, there's was his two topics on very pertinent subjects, and, and how appropriate. So a meeting in the afternoon and a meeting in the evening. And then they had to uh, ride through the city and out into the country about three quarters of an hour. They were going to meet with the head of the company that owned the cruise ship that they'd been on, it was a cordial thing, and there the pastor is once again in the lead rickshaw out in the country. And here he is ready to start a little closer picture, and once again a smile on his face. And then here he is sitting with the Japanese committee. So there was an international Bible students committee in Japan. And so you see that the, uh, the elders that went with him as well as some of the uh, committee standing behind him. And by the way, Sister Wilson went as well. She's on the far left. And you'll see her throughout the trip. So it wasn't just the men that went. And you can tell they were impressed by uh, the pictures that they took. They thought the costumes the costumes were rather unusual, the way the children were dressed. They were interested in the customs of having to take off your shoes and put on uh, little rice flat flip-flops and so forth. And they were also uh, impressed by the way that the women children carried their children as well. Now, as they got ready to leave Japan, now they're uh, shifting to a, uh, another ship, and they were coaling the ship at Nagasaki. This is something they've never really seen before. So they have 750 people on each side of the ship, so 1,500 people, and they pull up in these little junks full of coal, and then they would lash together bamboo ladders that went up the side and then as you see they're handing baskets of coal as they go up to load the coal on the ship. 3,000 tons was done in uh, six or seven hours. So mass human labor. The pastor was I think really impressed or the whole tour was really impressed with you know that we had reached a degree of mechanization and we had you know beasts of burden and so forth and here it was the humans that were doing all the, the manual labor. As we say today, they were killing the problem with thousands of people. Next, they proceeded to Shanghai. So now they're going to China. And to give you a little background, in China they had just had some massive floods. And as a result, there was a lot of starvation going around. 
And so this is the picture that they took uh, here. They got off the ship and they went, uh, some of them went to an inland city and they were really quite aghast at the starvation that was going on. And you get some idea of that. It's not a very clear picture, but you see the, uh, the bones. And, and they said many thousands of people are, st- are starving daily. And this, of course, was in uh, Shanghai in northern China. They proceeded, so they go from Shanghai now down to Hong Kong. This is about a three-day journey. They got there on January 11th. And Hong Kong was a little different. They didn't have the flooding issue there. And it was quite a cosmopolitan city for the Orient. And, of course, there was many things happening. There were rickshaws, sand pans, electric cars, sedan chairs. And because it had been a British colony, there was a you know, fair degree of uh, English and British kind of things around, English shops. Anyway, they were impressed by the, uh, the people doing barber work on the side of the road. And while they were there, there was a great procession with... Uh, uh, them carrying a dragon. Of course, we've all seen this in, in modern films, but uh, it was quite impressive in their day. And I think they were impressed also with just the masses of humanity crushing in. For any of you that have traveled the world to uh, third world countries, one of the things that really has an impact on you is you see just the crush of people. And this gives you some idea of that. This actually is a picture up in the British section, so it's very nice up there. You see the buildings and so forth. And then we see the contrast. And below this was actually a slum. And the pastor makes an interesting observation here. Below huddled in crowded tenements, a quarter of a million Chinese, part of the groaning creation, waiting for the times of restitution when Messiah sets up his glorious kingdom to bless not only these poor Chinese, but all the families of the earth. And so you see, as he started to personally experience the crush of humanity, the depth of poverty, and the use of human beings as beasts of burden, these were things that were foreign to them in their travels up till now. And so this had a very big impact. And of course, they were assessing where are we on the stream of time and and what present conditions are they lining up with what prophecy said and as, as he traveled, he realized that was the case. Next they go to, to Manila, and it was a rough trip, uh, two days. Manila's down in the uh, Philippines. General William Hall went along with him. He was one of the uh, Bible students, one of the elders there. And they went to a military club. They had many hundreds of people there. And so at this point, uh, General Hall dressed up appropriately, and he gave a talk on the Bible from a soldier standpoint. One of the other elders gave the Bible from a merchant standpoint. And a third elder gave the Bible from a doctor standpoint. They're feeling out their audiences. They've got the military. And now they're laying some seeds, they're planting some seeds. And this is the ride to Manila once again, uh, this time a horse-drawn cart. And it says, we found that One of the papers voluntarily announced that we had not arrived. Also published a lot of stuff about Pastor Russell. And from the inference, it wasn't good stuff. And I guess they had gotten that from the Brooklyn Eagle. The Brooklyn Eagle saw that where he was going to travel, and they apparently had an influence on this other paper. So they tried to uh, kind of sabotage him. And uh, his comment was, thus you see, Satan also came. So he was talking about that influence. So they kind of had some negative things going on when they hit the Philippines. But very quickly after they gave the talks, they were well received and lots of crowds came out to see them. And there was a meeting with a thousand presents, a public meeting, and the pastor gave a talk on where are the dead. You know, people that are questioning want to know where the dead are. And so it was an effective witness in his time as it is in our time as well. So they returned back up to Hong Kong, and uh, on their return, he was he was watching the children eat very uh, very meager portions. But compared to uh, Shanghai area, these children were at least not starving. While in Hong Kong, he met with the committee there, and the pastor gave a talk on the future state. 
And so from Hong Kong now we go down to uh, Singapore and Penang. And in Singapore they arrived there about January 26th. And uh, they went to a Chinese Anglo mission school and uh, visited there. And then later in the day at the Wesleyan Church he gave a talk on Daniel 12. I noticed that he doesn't give the same talks over and over again too much. He kind of suits it to whatever the uh, the need is in the particular area. Now they're in equatorial uh, area, so they have lush tropical vegetation and a corresponding lush tropical heat and humidity. And yet, you'll realize as you see the pictures, it doesn't change the way they dress. And this is a picture of a botanical garden, very beautiful, in Singapore. You know, I had a question given to me. I said, I've got all these pictures of Pastor Russell, and one of the young people in our class came and said, I've never seen a picture of Pastor Russell smiling. If you look at this picture, you can see his teeth. And what happened was he got in the rickshaw, and they wanted to take a picture of him, but the rickshaw man was afraid of the camera, so he he threw the thing down and ran off. And so you see Pastor Russell with a big smile on his face. He had a good sense of humor, I'm told. And later that day, he spoke at the uh, Wesleyan Church in Singapore on divine espousals. And then, of course, this is a picture of him back on the ship, uh, now heading for Penang. And so they arrived there about January 27th, and they were in the botanical garden. Now, the way you can tell it's very hot is they use umbrellas. They still dress the same way. Now, you'll also notice they switched off now to a pith helmet. So he's lost the top hat, and they've gone to a pith helmet. And you see Sister Wilson there as well in the middle. But it was near 100 degrees. And you see them with their long coats, still looking very very sharp. Next they head over to uh, Colombo, uh, which is an island, and then they'll go to India. So in Colombo, they're met by Brother Driscoll, who was there, and he boarded the ship. And then they went to a place called Leper Island. In the truth, we're asked to lay down our lives. Sometimes that means a little money. Sometimes that means effort, uh, sacrifice. When you go to an area with malaria, and they didn't have any anti-malarials then. When you go to an area with a lot of disease, and when you go to Leper Island, that's consecration. Most people wouldn't even go. There was... uh, I think they said there was about 290 lepers on this island, and they're isolated, and they really don't let people come and go. And the pastor went there. Here he is up preaching to them on leprosy as a picture of sin. And he, here he is speaking to the women lepers. You can't make him out very well um, because of the contrast in the picture. And then he also spoke to the men lepers as well. And then he had to get back to the riverboat while well, this was marsh and swamp. And so here, here he is with a pith helmet on, and there's two uh, people carrying him out to the riverboat. And they were quite Im- affected by the uh, poverty and so forth in the area. This was a uh, road scene near Colombo. This is not the leper colony, but this is kind of typical of living conditions. In fact, a rather nice building behind them. Next, they have head over to the mainland of India, Travancore. And the first part of the trip, they took by motor car. And you see the pastor just getting into the uh, motor car. And it was not what we would call luxurious. You see that they're basically sitting on top of each other and the sides are open. And they're passing through a village. Now, motor cars were uh, a novelty at this time. So the people were very interested in what was going on. And you'll notice that they also put up truth uh, banners on their car as well. And they go through uh, many villages. Even traveling in India today, it's difficult. The roads are at times bad or non-existent. He's showing the conditions of the day. And I think based on the number of pictures he took of this, they were particularly impacted by the mass of people and the mass of poverty and how the world, in this part of the world, it was relatively uh, uh, unenlightened and, uh, and, and hopeless. Now, when they arrived in Travancore, they have a small part of their reception committee shown here. They came out with banners, uh, literally hundreds of uh, brethren. 
This is a picture of the procession following the motor car. These were Bible students in India. And you'll notice the welcome sign. You can read welcome. Well, if you look up and down, it's, it says Russell up and down on the far right of that, that banner. So they're welcoming Pastor Russell. And the procession was a mile long. So this is a picture, I assume, from the car of that procession. And, uh, of course, dusty, hot conditions. And this is looking out the back of the car. The next picture actually shows you a silhouette. That's the pastor with his pith helmet looking out that, the back at the, uh, the crowd that's following. And I, I, I sense from this that they were quite overwhelmed with the, uh, with the welcome. When they got there in Travancore, the uh, IBS Hague uh, committee was there, and of course they had a band there as well. So he, they were just overwhelmed by the hospitality. You know, this is not unlike our brethren today when we go to Africa, the Philippines, India. Uh, the brethren, the warm hospitality is there regardless of economic circumstances. And so here's Brother Davy, who was kind of over that Indian effort, and the pastor, and they were decorated with, uh, with laurels of flowers. And this is the auditorium at Russell Pernum. More like a discussion meeting with all the elders on the Bible from a perspective. And guess what? It was the same perspectives that we heard uh, in, the, uh, in the Philippines from the perspective of a soldier, a merchant, and a doctor. And this is Brother Davy right in the middle in the black coat. And once again, he was kind of the, uh, the head of this. And you see there were a lot of helpers. So this is, in this area of India, there was a big truth movement. And, you know, that truth movement tends to be in that central core of India even today down the peninsula. And so we see that they have a long legacy of truth. And they're going now into Bethel. There's the pastor. with, him. And as he approaches the auditorium, in the auditorium, we'll show you that in a minute, he gave a uh, talk on glad tidings. And here's the auditorium. And so there was great discussion there. And they called this Bethel. When they arrived and afterwards, some girls came and sang for them. So there was great festivity here. Pastor Russell uh, sat among the native uh, workers here. So you see there was quite a nucleus of Bible students even at that time in India. And so the pastor was evaluating, as well as the rest of the committee, what made this effective. And one of the things that helped make it effective was, well, they were obviously had been a British colony, so they spoke English, a lot of them. But he was starting to realize the importance of translating all of the truth materials into different languages. And I think what you'll see is right after the return from this trip, that became more of a priority. Here's a group from Russell Purnam, and they gave a talk on fellow servants and how appropriate, because these were uh, those that were very zealous in the truth, the Indian brethren. And Sister Wilson, the, the sister that went along, yeah, there was lots of sisters that walked along with her cart. And Brother Pyle there, remember, he was one of the committee members. He's on the left holding up a young child. Uh, he, he loved children, and in India there are lots of children. When they left Russell Purnam, they, they went to uh, their motor car. It was quite a distance. Well, you get an idea of the distance they had to... Uh, to go, so they have to go across this tapioca field and through the city, and finally they get to the motor car. This was a really unique motor car because it was a double-decker British bus that had just apparently was fairly new, and so it was quite an attraction. And they use this to uh, to get around. So they go on to the next city, and the native brethren are helping by carrying their luggage. If you look on the right, you see luggage on the head. And here he gave a talk on God's people. And once again, this was that nucleus in, in South Central India where there was a lot of brethren. And there was an enthusiastic band in the city that they came into. So actually a brass band with drums and it looks like an accordion as well. And they returned once again back to Russell Purnam. So they were making side trips in a lot of these cities. They'd either go overnight or they'd make side trips on the day. And this is called the First Tabernacle in Travancore. And this is their meeting building. And there was also a, uh, a nice traveler's bung bungalow at Travandum. 
Now, one of the things they did from here is this was a central hub as well, and so they did what they call their ox cart pilgrimage. And I want you to look at the size of that cart. I thought it was like a covered wagon, but it's like a miniature covered wagon. It's small. He says, The ox carts were provided for us, which are rather small affairs on two wheels drawn by two bullocks, which travel at a rate of about two miles an hour down incredibly bumpy, hot, dusty, dirty roads. So this was not what we would call your deluxe accommodations. And yet the pastor, who now is in his 60s, and many of the other members are going in these ox carts. Part of this pilgrimage was to go to neighboring villages. You can just barely see the pastor in the middle there. He gave a talk on the destiny of man. And afterwards, you know, they, the brethren got a well-deserved rest under the cool of the bungalow. Now they're, they're not done. They go continue on the ox cart uh, pilgrimage. And I want you to look at the size of that. So the cart is about as tall as the pastor is. Not very, so six feet high total. And you notice that thing's three feet off the ground, so it's very short inside. Here the pastor is climbing in. And I'm assuming all three of those brethren got in that tiny cart. So let's never com complain about being crowded in our air-conditioned cars. They continued on to another city where he gave a talk on the signs of the times. And Brother Wilson was looking for his wife <laughs> in one of these carts. Kind of a cute picture of him going around looking. You get an idea how small they are with three or four people in that. And along the way, they went through various villages and very simple lifestyle. They were impressed by things like the way that they uh, did native work, whether it be pottery or uh, making curry or carrying water. They're quite intrigued, as I was the first time I went to Africa, where they carry everything on their heads. Uh, it's an interesting custom. This is the ox cart parking lot. The deluxe accommodations there. And this did beat walking. So, And this is a typical house in Travancore. So very, very simple accommodations. And there are uh, some nicer uh, villages. Here's one amongst the palms. And he gave a talk on uh, who is Jesus at this uh, little village. And then here's a picture of him leaving the bungalow, getting ready for another part of the journey. And once again, you know, they're still wearing their Western garb. Uh, the comment on this picture was running to and fro. Natives crowded into uh, their train cars like sardines. If you look over to the left of this, you see the uh, train cars. And, of course, we've all seen pictures where they'll sit on top of the cars as well. Here's a Hindu woman cooking. They were quite impressed by that. And the caption under this picture was, Men and women as beasts of burden. And so you see, he was really impressed by how they weren't even using beasts to do the work, let alone uh, any kind of mechanized things. And of course, you know, everything is there, so you can get a shave, a haircut, goldsmiths on the street, right there. They continued on to Madras, and here was the uh, native train station there. There he gave a talk on the parables of the kingdom, and uh, this was outlined actually on the first sheet, there was a class here and they went through a number of the parables uh, I assume probably each of the elders took one of the parables because uh, it was a very long article now this almost looks like it must be Europe uh, but actually this is uh, the steps of St. Thomas and this is in the Madras area and the tradition has it that about 52 AD the Apostle Thomas came to this part of the world and worked and preached until he was killed by the Brahmins and you see the pastor standing on the top here with his pith helmet once again. So they continued on up. Now they're going to go to Calcutta and Bombay. So they've been all around the central part of South India and on to Calcutta. Here's religious worship at the River Ganges. And they gave a public uh, talk here on the great hereafter. One of the things that really impressed him was how pagan uh, this area was. There are thousands of gods. Even the brethren that go there today say, you know, when you go to India, everything is a god. And you realize how pagan it is. And 
how precious it is that you see these brothers see the truth about the one God. And they see it with clarity and they reject the paganism that surrounds them. He said in Benares alone that there was about 2,000 temples and shrines. And there's shrines and temples to monkeys and to rats and, you know, everything in the world. And this is a picture again of the Hindu temple at Benares. Next they proceed uh, on to Bombay. They didn't really say how they got there, and I think it was probably by train. And from Bombay, now they're going to go into Egypt and then finish out their sea. You can see a uh, little bit of a sigh of relief because that was a tough part of the trip in India. They were exposed there for right on a month in uh, equatorial India. It was very hot and humid. And here they are looking out over the ocean as they continue. And, of course, there was discussions all the way along when they crossed the Red Sea. There were you know, discussions about the events that had happened there. When they got into Egypt, of course, they uh, headed up to the Giza Plateau. And the first and second pyramids are shown here in one of their travel pictures. Of course, the Great Pyramid, once again, a travel picture. And now, here they are en route to the uh, pyramids. And you'll notice the pastor now is wearing like a white trench coat with a black bowler hat on. Once again, uh, looking very good. It's fortunate he did this because that's how we could pick him out from these uh, not very clear pictures. So here he is, and there they met Brother Edgar Morton. And, of course, he's the one that has written uh, extensively on the uh, pyramid. And so they had a personal tour by Brother Edgar, and he's pointing out interesting features. If you want to go to the top, you can go up the northeast corner. You get an idea of the scale of that pyramid and the ruggedness. Uh, Brother Pyle said, I would give a dollar if I had not started. He, he had quite a bit of problem, and you'll notice that the pastor is giving him a hand to pull him up. Uh, they finally arrive at the entrance to the descending passage, and here's a picture of them outside the descending passage. And when you read the account, they got the full tour of the pyramid. They went up the ascending passage into the Grand Gallery, into the King's Chamber. So they went all over. Brother Edgar, of course, was a wealth of knowledge on that. I put the uh, little sign over Brother Edgar. He's got a, a great mustache. Here they are, photographed by the Sphinx in the pastor's hat. You can see right in front of the Sphinx. And here they are, uh, once again, on camel, uh, viewing the ruins. And uh, Brother Edgar and Brother Jones on their camels going. And they were very impressed, of course, with the uh, monolithic uh, size of monuments there. You know, originally they had planned when they left India to go down into uh, equatorial Africa. But because of the time frame, they had to get back for the Chautauqua Convention. And they had to get back. Here they are waiting for their uh, car at Alexandria and saying goodbye to Brother Edgar. From there, they proceed on to Athens, Greece. And in Athens, they meet with the uh, brethren that are there, of course, well-established class. They go to the Parthenon, the pastor there. Interesting caption, Pompey's Pillar, no monkey built this. And here's the pastor ascending uh, Mars Hill. So the key here is, once again, he's got his top hat on and his black coat. Here they are on top of Mars Hill. And... There was singing, and then the pastor gave remarks on if there is no resurrection, which you'll remember the Apostle Paul gave on this site. And so you see him here, the pastor, sitting down and giving the talk, his opening remarks. And you can see in the, in the distance Athens. So here they are listening, and then they come back down the hill, and this is the spot where Paul preached. Here he is descending down Mars Hill. And now they look at the uh, rock where the monster she's uh, orated. And they're now standing in front of the uh, prison where Socrates was, was held. They continued and they preached at St. Paul's Greek Cathedral. They continued touring. During a public meeting later that day, they gave a public talk on Take Up Thy Cross. The pastor was not remiss to visit uh, infirm brethren, and so he, he visited this sick Greek brother who couldn't come out, and while we're, they were there, they had a question meeting. They went on to Corinth, uh, and they spoke at uh, St. Paul's 
Greek church where we talked on where is the dead and which are the which is the true church. It continued on to Paris just briefly. There, Pastor Russell really gave a trip report. He met with a little class in a great city. On to London. And on Sunday, Brother Russell spoke with the friends at the London Tabernacle. And he had meetings for about a week there. This was a little chance to uh, recoup. And here are the brethren singing as they sailed from Liverpool. Now, what I was impressed with on this trip, and so then they headed back, it says, immediately following this event, they were given increased momentum. Remember one of his goals? To spread the word? Truth by thus making for himself his sermons of more international reputation. And I didn't realize, he says, many of the newspapers thereafter sought the privilege of publishing his sermons. So it's saying prior to that, they were kind of picking and choosing. Once he had done this world tour and published, now he was very preeminent. It helped the work very much. And so I think it also helped in, uh, in spreading the truth and in helping finance what happened shortly thereafter, which was the photodrama, as the, uh, the gathering grew. Now, this is evidence of that. This is a paper from 1917, and this is after his death. And yet, if you look, the green line shows you the portion of the religious page that is Pastor Russell's, including the photodrama, a masterpiece, great worldwide witness for the truth, a, jo a joyful sound of silver trumpets, and the pastor's picture. And so we look at the objectives, and we see that really they met all of the objectives uh, with this uh, world tour. And remember, it started out, what was his goal? To preach the gospel throughout the world. And the work goes grandly on, even to our day. <laughs>